in general or on the, the coronaviruses life cycle? Okay. Well, I'm going to go on with the rabies life cycle then, or the rhabdoviruses. As I say, much of this comes from vesicular stomatitis virus. Uh, so here we've got our shrimp rat, shrink rat slinky. The G protein acts as the attachment protein, binds to a receptor on the cell surface, taken up. This is all review from the um, overview of replication lecture, really. It's taken up into a vesicle that's pinched off into an endosome. That becomes acidified because there are hydrogen ion pumps in the membrane. Once this is acidified, this G protein undergoes a conformational change and now becomes active as a fusion protein. So it's acting as an attachment protein here, as a fusion protein down here. Uh, that causes the two membranes to fuse. And as we went through in the replication lecture, that means that this membrane now comes continuous with the vesical membrane and the nuclear capsid is free to go out into the cytoplasm. And that polymerase, I said the polymerase complex is associated with the nuclear capsid and that will go out in the cytoplasm with it as well. Like so many of these RNA viruses, the rhabdoviruses do not go to the nucleus. They spend their entire life in the cytoplasm, just like the coronaviruses. Uh, so it doesn't need to go any further. Uh, and also, it turns out that that viral polymerase is highly specialized, and it will actually be able to copy the RNA while it's still a part of the helical nuclear capsid. So it doesn't need any further uncoating. The fusion with the membrane uh, and the release of the cytoplasm is all it needs in the way of uncoating. So now we've got the nuclear capsid with its associated polymerase in the cytoplasm. And of course, for these RNA viruses, uh, there are plenty of RNA precursors in the cell because we're making RNA all the time. We have plenty of RNA precursors. So it doesn't have the same problems as making DNA. So, cytoplasmic replication, and as I say, the input RNA remains in the nuclear capsid form. So here we said it was negative sense, so it doesn't function as RNA. So the polymerase, which of course it has to take in with it in order to make the first messages, copy this, and they make five individual messages. It has five proteins, since the polymerase complex is two of them. And it makes one message for each of these. So it's taking the approach of We've got, to, I want to make five proteins. I'm going to make five monocystronic messages. These are caps and methylated and polyadenylated, and that polymerase uh, can do that as well. So it's a, it's a rather large enzyme, uh, and it can do, make the message and cap and methylate it and polyadenylate it. So these look like authentic host cell messages, and they are then translated. And they're already in the cytoplasm, so they're just translated in the cytoplasm, and you immediately make all five of the viral proteins. This process is called transcription, since making messages is known as transcription. And so in this case, it can be called the viral transcriptase, but it's an RNA polymerase. When an RNA polymerase is making messages, it's sometimes referred to as a transcriptase. If it's replicating the genome, it's sometimes referred to as a replicase, uh, but in all cases, it's just the RNA polymerase. So that's transcription. So initially, that's what's made, but once these host cells, these viral proteins start piling up, uh, then the virus can start replicating. And for replication, same enzyme, but now it's sometimes known as a replicase. Uh, and instead of making individual little messages, it makes one full-length copy uh, in the anti-parallel direction, 5' prime to 3' prime, by standard Watson-Crick based pairing of the RNA. So now you get, from your negative sense, you get a positive sense, full-length RNA, and this isn't capped or polyadenylated. It's a perfectly accurate copy of this. And then this is used as a template to make more negative strand, and again, it's made 5' prime to 3' prime uh, <coughs> by Watson Crick brace pairing. And now, basically, what you've done is you've replicated your genome. So it's just like we saw with polioviruses, except in this case, it's negative to positive to negative, and that was positive to negative to positive. That's the same principle. You always have to copy by the opposite sense. 
Now, one thing I com commented on is the genome is actually doesn't have to uncoat. It's used as a nuclear capsid. So it's actually coated with that nuclear capsid or N protein. And I also commented that protein synthesis is required to make a full-length copy. And one of the reasons for that is the full-length copy has to be, in order to go into the replication mode, you need enough N protein that you coat the new replica replicating RNA with the nuclear capsid protein as it's made. So if you look at this, as it's made, the nuclear capsid protein binds to it and assembles it into uh, the helical nuclear capsid. And that will happen. So then the polymerase uses this nuclear capsid, just as it uses this nuclear capsid as a template, it uses the positive sense nuclear capsid as a template, and then that is copied back into a negative sense nuclear capsid. So the replication occurs when you have enough protein to coat these intermediates and keep them protected from any ribonuclease in the cell. Messenger RNA or transcription, you make lots of basically naked, although RNA in the cell is never perfectly naked. It will always just bind non-specific proteins because it's charged. It's, for this purposes, we'll call it naked RNA in the cell. So these are free to go off and be translated by ribosomes. The ribosomes won't translate this. One, it doesn't have a cap, and two, it's a nuclear capsid, and RNA, uh, the ribosomes won't translate that. Okay, so now you've got new genome here. And what you can do here is you can package it, or you can use it as a template for more replication, or you can use it as a template for more RNA. And what it's used for would depend on what's going on at the time, how much protein you've got, because protein, nuclear capsid protein pools increasing will drive it in the replication direction. And once you've got lots of replication going on, uh, then it will start budding out of the cell. Any questions? Meanwhile, we've now assembled new nuclear capsids, and actually, as those nuclear capsids are synthesized, the polymerase complex will bind to them. Uh, it, so they will actually get polymerase complex uh, binding to them. So you've got the internal part of the virus has been assembled as a part of the replication process. What about the external part? What about the envelope? Um, the envelope is made, the proteins are made on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they've got signal sequences. Those are recognized. Uh, they're made uh, as transmembrane glycoproteins, um, just the way that our plasma membrane transmembrane glycoproteins are made. Um, so they're made on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They then go in vesicles to the Golgi, where those uh, glycosylation um, carbohydrate side chains are further refined. And then from the Golgi, they're delivered in vesicles to the plasma membrane. When these vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane, um, these transmembrane glycoproteins will be delivered into the plasma membrane just the way that ours are. So now you've got the envelope part. How do you stick the two together? And that's where this M protein for maturation comes in. So the M protein is a cytoplasmic protein. It's free to float around in the cytoplasm, but it recognizes and binds to the cytoplasmic tail of these transmembrane glycoproteins. Uh, and so it will line the inside of the transmembrane glycoproteins. It also recognizes the nuclear capsid. So what it does is it enables these two halves to get together. Uh, and so this will then start budding out of the cell. Uh, and what you eventually will get is as this pushes out, this will pinch off, seal behind, and you'll get a new virus particle release. So, um, are there any questions about this process? The orange shows the polymerase complex associated with it. It just buds out of the cell. So, what are some points to note about these rhabdoviruses? The entire life cycle occurs in the cytoplasm, just like it did with the coronaviruses. The RNA, polymerase, uh, uh, the RNA polymerase and RNA modification enzymes are virally coded. As I say, for these RNA viruses, the polymerase always has to be virally coded. But because it's negative sense, unlike with the coronaviruses, it has to be present in the virion because if you're going to have to make message when you get in the cell, you're going to have to take whatever you need to make in with you. And again, there's no early or late division. Everything happens at once. Any questions? Okay.
So we're going to go on to the Paramix ovaris family. And the Paramix ovaris family is basically, to, to a large extent, going to be a review of the Rhabdovirus family because much of its life cycle is the same. But there's some subtle additions that I want to add on. So this is going to be part review and part new stuff. Okay, so the members, and you're going to be hearing more about mumps and measles from me, and you're going to hear, be hearing um, uh, more about parainfluenza and respiratory syncytial virus uh, from Dr. Narian. Uh, but the members include things that cause parainfluenza virus. So this is something that has a lot of similarities to influenza, but it's not caused by influenza virus. It's, it's caused by human parainfluenza virus, mumps, measles virus, respiratory syncytial virus, which is um, particularly serious in small infants. <coughs> and we'll be, you'll be hearing a lot more about these. Um, again, what is their structure? Now, they look really rather different from rhabdoviruses, as you can see. They don't have that typical bullet shape. This shows it as being a, a sphere. Um, they're actually what's called pleomorphic. In other words, if you look at a preparation of them, uh, they won't all look spherical. They'll look sort of rather messy. Um, and uh, that just means, so pleomorphic means they've got many forms. But basically, the principal structure is uh, that they have a helical nuclear capsid, but rather than being the slinky model, uh, their helical nuclear capsid is the telephone cord model. So when you look at it, it looks like really rather a mess inside the virus particle. It even, doesn't even look as easy to see as this uh, because it's, it's flexible uh, and it, it's folded up on itself. And it, they're not shrink-wrapped which is another reason why they don't look so pretty as the rhabdoviruses, um, that you can think of them as basically having a loose plastic bag around them. So, so they, they've got a big bag with a, a, a rather floppy stuff inside them. And, and so they don't look nearly as well organized as the rhabdoviruses. But really, both of them have got a helical nuclear capsid with an envelope on. It's just the question of, are you a, a baggy telephone cord or are you sh a shrink-wrapped slinky? So, very similar. Helical nuclear capsid, it has a nuclear capsid protein associated with it, um, which is, um, in this case, called NP, uh, N for nuclear capsid, P for protein. Uh, and I'm not making too much fuss about these names, but I'm using the correct name as I go through, or at least the currently correct name. Um, so, here's a nuclear capsid coated with its nuclear capsid, pro uh, an RNA coated with the nuclear capsid protein, negative sense again. And again, because it's negative sense, it will need to take a polymerase complex with it. And again, that polymerase complex consists of a couple of proteins which are associated with this nuclear capsid. Uh, again, it has an envelope. And again, there's an M protein which plays an important role in maturation. It's going to make, play the same role as in the rhabdoviruses, enabling the nuclear capsid to get in touch with the envelope. And the envelope, again, has got glycoproteins in it, but this one has got two types of glycoprotein. Uh, it's got one here, which I put HN or H or G, and we'll see why it has different names in a moment. Uh, but this is basically the attachment protein. And then it has the fusion protein. It's a separate protein here. So rhabdoviruses, these two functions were part of the same protein. Here, they're part of a different protein. They're different protein. OK, so why do we have these different glycoproteins? And there are different genera within the paramyxovirus family. Um, the paramyxovirus genus itself has got a glycoprotein called NH. Um, the morbillivirus or measles group has got one called H. And the respiratory syncytial group has one called G. So what, why do they have these different names? And the H stands for hemagglutinin. So if we take red blood cells, uh, that's why they're called hemagglutinins, because it's comes from the red blood cells. Uh, if we take the red blood cells, uh, it means that the viruses combine to the red blood cells. Now, they're going to go nowhere. They can't infect red blood cells. The red blood cells are not suitable uh, for replication. Uh, but they can bind to the red blood cells. And if they bind to the red blood cells, because that, like that attachment protein can recognize something on the surface of red blood cells, then since they've got multiple attachment proteins on them, they, they can bind to more than one red blood cell at a time. 
And so what you can get is you can get these red blood cells linking together. So it's just like antibodies and hemagglutination that you've already had before. Uh, and this means that you get these hemagglutination networks of red blood cells uh, if you have virus particles which recognize their surface. And this, of course, uh, can be useful in the lab because you can actually measure crudely the amounts of virus you've got uh, by looking at how much you can dilute it before it will no longer hemagglutinate the red blood cells. And you'll have a POPs exercise coming up uh, that is going to look at just that. Uh, also, if you, in the lab, if you've got your pure virus, like your pure, say, um, human parainfluenza 1 virus, if you want to know, does Dr. Hunt have human parainfluenza 1 or does she have something else, um, then if you add my anti-serum to this, uh, I should, if you've given me long enough to suffer from it before you're doing it, um, I should have antibodies to this, and my anti-serum would prevent this if you add human parainfluenza 1 here. If you were using some other virus to hemagglutinate, uh, if I hadn't been exposed to that virus, my anti-serum wouldn't block it. So you could tell which virus I've been exposed to by which, uh, which virus my anti-serum will block, which virus I have anti-serum for. So how do you do this? And I didn't know whether you'd seen this, so I put this slide in. Let's see if I can lower the lights a little bit. So what you have is a plastic plate, which I forgot to bring here, but it's just a plastic plate that's got lots of little wells. It's got 96 wells in it. And well, I should have bought it, but oh well. So what you do is you put your red blood cells into that plate, uh, and then you add whatever you think is going to hemagglutinate it, if you're measuring virus for its hemagglutination ability. And as you dilute the virus, um, it will stop agglutinating. So here, if, if you had the virus, and you could, I will show you this in more detail, but um, as you dilute the, the virus, there's no longer enough to hemagglutinate the cells, um, and the cells will not hemagglutinate. So instead of forming a meshwork and a sort of um, net of red blood cells, you'll have single red blood cells, and they can just form a little pellet at the bottom of these 96 wells. But if they form a net, then they spread out and you get a big area of red blood cells. So what you could do is if you had the 96 well plate, if you think of this as being the 96 well plate, um, and you want to look at what's happening, um, what you could do is you could look at like that and say that's hemagglutinated, that hasn't. Um, but after you've done this too many times, you decide that you've got some better way to get around your sore neck. And so you can go to a higher tech method. And what you do is you put the plate on here, and instead of looking up, you look down in the mirror, and you see what's going on. And in fact, the manufacturers of the plate have, fought, have thoughtfully labeled it so that when you look in the mirror, the, the numbers and the letters are the right way around so that you know that, plate, that well A12 did something or other. Um, these days, we're rather more high tech than that. You've got plate readers, so you don't even have to worry. But I'm just showing you the principle of what I'm going to show you here. Okay, so here is my thumb starring in a major motion picture. And if you look down in the mirror, this is what you see. And so here, this was a, a series of um, virus dilutions. And here, there's enough virus to cause the hemagglutination. And you can see you get these sort of membrane-like things, which is because all these red blood cells are linked together and behaving as a unit rather than single red blood cells. As you dilute it out, the red blood cells will pellet down and form a pellet at the bottom because there's no longer enough virus to do it. So that's just a simple process of hemagglutination. Okay, the question is, at what point do you say there's no longer hemagglutination? The, the last one in which you can clearly see something you say is hemagglutination. And here, um, there may be a little bit, you know, there may be some some cases where two or three blood cells have got together, but there's not enough virus to create this big stable network. Uh, and so this is said not to be. It's a pretty crude method. You're not measuring individual virus particles. You need a lot of virus particles in, in order to get uh, just one hemagglutination unit. And you'll be going into how you do this in the POPs test. 
So why do we use it? Don't know how to go back. No. Okay, bear with me. I have to go through the whole thing, I think. I'm not quite sure. You're going to go? So, hemagglutination tests are used because they're quick, they're easy, and they're cheap. Or you need the red blood cells. They're easy to detect. You don't have to use any elaborate methods to detect these things. You can see them with the naked eye, whether they are hemagglutinated or not. Um, and you can use them to detect the virus, as I was showing you in that case, or, as I say, antibody, because if you've got enough virus to hemagglutinate, then you can see if you've got enough antibody to reverse it, because the virus, the antibody would coat those attachment proteins uh, and prevent them uh, causing hemagglutination. Uh, but do remember that when you are using it to measure virus particles, you're measuring the amount of virus, the amount of hemagglutin in there. You're not measuring whether this virus is infectious. It has, this test has nothing to do with infectivity. Uh, so it, we, the usual flu vaccine at the moment, for example, is uh, an inactivated vaccine. Uh, in, for the inactivated vaccine, you can measure the amount of flu particles in it by measuring the hemagglutination. But uh, it should not be infectious. So hemagglutination and infectivity uh, don't really necessarily, it doesn't tell you anything about infectivity, but it does tell you about how much virus you've got there. So it's a measure to assay the amount of material you've got there in a relatively crude fashion, but it's quick and easy uh, and it's very widely used. Uh, but there is a variant, and I shouldn't have switched the lights back on, but there is a variant of this um, which does actually uh, look for infectivity. And that is, I showed you cell culture before, and here at the background here are, are, is, are cells growing on a plastic surface as a single layer of cells. Uh, and in this case, it's been infected with influenza because influenza also has hemagglutination activity. And if you take... The, the cells growing in a Petri dish, a special Petri dish so that the cells will stick, or, or a bottle or something like that, you just tip off the liquid and add a solution of red blood cells to it, then if the virus has a hemagglutinin, as it replicates in the red blood cells, that's going to get into the membrane, just like the G protein in rhabdoviruses got into the membrane, the hemagglutinin in the paramyxoviruses is going to get into the host cell membrane. When it's in the host cell membrane, of course, it can bind red blood cells. So if you're trying to culture virus and you want a quick answer as to is there, a virus, is there a hemagglutinating virus here because that will immediately narrow down the options. And then you can also ask, will any of my panel of antibodies prevent this binding? If you just flood it with red blood cells, the red blood cells will bind to the hemagglutinin. And so this is called hemadsorption. And what this is not a measure of virus particles, it's a measure of which cells of virus infected cells. Uh, but in order for this to work, the virus has to actually grow and the hemagglutinin gets inserted into the membrane. So you can only do this with live virus. An activated virus won't give you a positive result. But you can see hemagglutination, which can enable you to rapidly determine whether these cells are really infected. You don't have to wait for long enough for this kind of time that a plaque assay will take, which is several days. Uh, this can be much quicker. And also, as I say, you can use, um, see which antibodies will neutralize the, this hemagglutinin and stop the red blood cells binding. Okay. So away from the red blood cells, the H describes then those proteins, which are those viruses which have got a hemagglutin in. For the pneumovirus group, um, their G protein does not have a hemagglutin in. It's just an attachment protein, uh, but it doesn't recognize a receptor on red blood cells, so you can't use a hemagglutination test. So what about the N part here? Um, the N is for neuraminidase. So it's an enzyme that destroys neuraminic or sialic acid. And our cell surfaces are covered with that. Uh, and I will come at the end um, to explain why that is important. Um, so bear with me on the neuraminidase. We'll come back to why that is. So here, um, paramyxoviruses and um, the rubula virus, which includes mumps, uh, these two groups, that attachment protein also has neuraminidase activity. Yeah. The other proteins do not have neuraminidase, so they don't have the end. 
Okay, the other protein is the F for fusion, and that's the same in all of them, thank goodness. And that protein works at physiological pH. So when the virus gets into the cell, it's the same as we've already talked about basically with herpes, which also fuses at physiological pH. The virus attaches to the cell via the attachment protein, that H or HN or G protein. Uh, it then becomes close contact with the host cell, and the fusion protein facilitates fusion at the same pH as outside the cell, i.e. pH 7, pH 7.4, neutral pH, that physiological pH, that region. And then it gets into the cytoplasm uh, and replicates. And as I pointed out before, the, once it grows, these same proteins that are in the viral envelope will be put into the host cell plasma membrane, and that will enable one cell to fuse with the next cell because that cell will have the attachment protein and the fusion protein in its plasma membrane, and that's all that you have here. It's just a membrane with those two proteins in uh, that causes fusion. So you'll get fusion with the paramyx of viruses, just as I went through in detail with the herpes viruses, and hence the name respiratory syncytial virus, because you see syncytia, uh, i.e. multinucleate cells, uh, and same thing with the other members of this family. It's a uh, typical feature of the paramyx of viruses. Okay. So you have these sort of special features of the uh, attachment protein and the fusion protein, and they're on separate proteins. But once the nuclear capsid gets into the cytoplasm, it's just a very similar story here to what we saw with the rhabdoviruses. Um, the genome remains a nuclear capsid. The viral polymerase, again, is, um, able to, is specialized and able to copy this nuclear capsid into message. So you make your messenger RNAs. Again, they're monocystronic. In this case, um, they, you get six messages, or at least they're primarily monocystronic. In this case, you get six messages uh, because we have an extra protein in the envelope. Uh, when you make enough of that nuclear capsid protein, you can now switch over to replication mode, and again, Transcription and replication are done by the same RNA polymerase. So sometimes it's called a transcriptase here, sometimes a replicase here, same enzyme. Uh, and the negative sense RNA is then copied into a completely accurate full length five prime to three prime copy of the genome. Uh, and that positive sense is then used as a template to more, make more negative sense. Um, Meanwhile, so that negative sense nuclear capsid again can either be packaged back into nuclear capsid used to make more message, used for more replication. Uh, and again, it associates with the polymerase as it's made. Um, and again, you have your envelope component is made on the rough end of plasmic reticulum. In this case, of course, we've got two proteins rather than one. Um, but again, they go through the Golgi where the carbohydrate side chains are refined and again, they're delivered to the plasma membrane. And again, we've got soluble M protein floating around in the cytoplasm, and it will bind to the cytoplasmic tails up here. So the M protein will coat the inner surface of the plasma membrane, and the nuclear capsid will recognize that, uh, and your, this virus will push out, and eventually it will bud off, uh, and uh, you'll get a new virus part. Any questions there? As I say, that, that part of the life cycle is basically just the same as the rhabdoviruses. I said I'd come back to the role of the neuraminidase. And the neuraminidase is a consequence of the fact that sialic acid is a very um, common component. We have tons of it on the surface of our cells. So if you didn't have a neuraminidase, the cell that this had just popped out of would have neuraminic acid or sialic acid all over its surface, and so would the virus. That doesn't matter <coughs> for most viruses, uh, and they, I didn't point it out, but herpes virus will have that on its surface. Um, but these, some of these viruses, their receptor on the host cell, sialic acid is an important part of it. So they would actually, since they can actually recognize sialic acid as their receptor, uh, this virus would never leave this cell. 
It would just bind straight back to it because it's the closest thing around it and it would bind to this cell. Um, in fact, if other viruses would be released, they would also bind to the cell or even to other viruses. So what you would have if you, it would be that these would never be able to get away uh, because they basically it's like having Velcro on. Your attachment proteins will always bind to everything else in the environment and, and it'd just be totally sticky. Uh, so if you recognize as, part, as, as cyanic acid is your receptor, you can't get away. So the only way you could get away is to destroy the cyanic acid. And so that these viruses that use cyanic acid as a receptor have an enzyme on the surface uh, that will remove that cyanic acid. So while this virus was growing in this cell, it had put that these, one of these proteins, either the, the circle or the diamond, uh, but the hemagglutinin in uraminidase protein uh, would be digesting away all this cyanic acid keeping the cell surface free of cyanic acid. It didn't actually start even in the Golgi. Uh, so it would keep this cell surface free of cyanic acid. And of course, since the viral membrane is derived from the host cell membrane, it would automatically keep this free. And so these wouldn't have this and they'd be free to float away. So without it, you can float away and go off and infect more cells. But if that neuromenidase is inhibited, it really decreases the spread of virus and its ability to get away. So one question you might say was, how does it get into the cell? If it digests its own receptor, how does it get into the cell? And the answer apparently is once it meets the receptor, the fusion is so quick that it doesn't have time to digest it and go off. But it also means that these viruses um, are acquired by the respiratory route, the ones that we're talking about in the paramyxa virus family. Uh, and we've got lots of mucus and that's got lots of cyanic acid. So if it didn't have a neuraminidase, it would just get hooked up on the mucus and it would never get anywhere. So the neuraminidase allows it to slowly borrow through the mucus and then when it meets a cell, it pops into the cell and it can breathe a sigh of relief and carry on with the rest of it, its life. Now, any questions on the neuraminidase? The other thing I wanted to comment about is the fusion protein because this is another feature um, that... Uh, is seen in quite a lot of these viruses that use fusion proteins. Um, the fusion protein is made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, as a transmembrane protein. And then later on, it is cleaved by a protease. Uh, and this little bit that I've shown in red here, which was part of the polypeptide chain here, can now flip out. And in many viruses, including the paramyxoviruses, these little bits may be kept together. They may not be, they may be, uh, this little bit may float off in some viruses, but in this case, they're kept together by disulfide bonds. There's a cysteine here, di disulfide bonded with the cysteine here, so you keep this bit of the molecule still attached. Um, but what this means now is this is active for fusion. This fusion protein is going to bury itself in the membrane. It can't do that while it's part of a polypeptide chain. It needs to be released. Um, so these fusion proteins, as made, are inactive and get activated. And that's typical for fusion proteins. Um, why is that typical? Well, one thing is, if you think about the cell, we have a very precise organization of our membrane organelles. Rough endoplasmic reticulum make vesicles. They go to a very organized Golgi. They move from the cis to the trans Golgi. They go up to the plasma membrane. If you had this non-specific fusion protein, everything would start fusing together, it would be a complete mess and you wouldn't manage to target everything to where it should be. So you want to avoid the complete mess in this case because the virus is interested in getting its own proteins up here. It, it really cares about this, this, prote this pathway functioning, it's going to use it. Uh, so the fusion protein is, is made here but it isn't activated until very late for most of these sort of viruses. In the case of paramyxoviruses, it's activated just about here, just about as it gets to the, the membrane. So it doesn't cause a major problem by disorganizing the whole cytoplasm. In some viruses, as we'll see later on, it's not activated until it gets out of the cell. Uh, in fact, you even saw that with the rhabdovirus. That glycoprotein in the rhabdovirus functions as a fusion protein. But it's not active here because it's not going to be activated till it gets into acidic endosome in the next cell. So these fusion proteins tend to be kept under wraps um, until they're needed. 
And, and that may explain why so many of these are activated by uh, acidification. It, it keeps them inactive until they get into the next cell. This particular virus is going to fuse directly with the plasma membrane, so this has to be activated uh, before it meets a plasma membrane even, and so it's activated at the late stage here. Okay, so just to summarize some of the differences between the rhabdoviruses and the paramyxoviruses, as I say, in terms of their actual assembly rules, they're both helical nuclear capsids in an envelope. Uh, but uh, the rhabdoviruses are, are bullet-shaped or so-called bacilliform because they look rather like uh, bacilli. Uh, the paramyxoviruses are round, although it's a bit sloppy, so they, have, they don't all look like perfect spheres if you look in the microscope. Uh, the rhabdoviruses have one glycoprotein, and that's got both attachment and fusion activities, and the fusion protein isn't activated until the mature virus infects a new cell, gets into an endosome, and meets an acidic environment. The paramyxoviruses have two glycoproteins, so they've got a distribution of labor. One is involved in attachment, and one is involved in fusion, uh, and the fusion protein functions at neutral physiological pH, so it's active as soon as it meets the next cell, which means it has to be activated before it meets the next cell. And it's activated, as we say, at late stage in, in, in development. And these attachment proteins, some of them are hemagglutinins, and some of those hemo, uh, some of them yeah, are hemagglutinins, and some of those actually recognize sialic acid, and if they recognize sialic acid, they have they also have to have a neuraminidase component to their attachment protein. Questions? Okay. So now we're going to, those were both non-segmented negative strand viruses. And now we're going to change to influenza, true influenza viruses, true ortho uh, so these are the ortho paramyxovirus, uh, the ortho myxoviruses. Myxo means uh, mucus, and they infect by the respiratory route. Again, uh, so these are influenza. Um, there are actually three strains of influenza that affect us: type A, type B, and type C. And we're more, type C we're barely concerned about at the moment. Type C is below the radar. Uh, type A and B are the ones that cause the most of the human illness that you're going to be concerned about in the clinics. At least I hope so. I hope C doesn't rear its ugly head. Um, at the moment, it's a nice head. Okay, so the, the automyxoviruses are negative sense as well, but now we have multiple segments. So there are actually, for A and B, there are eight segments of genome. But again, it's a helical telephone cord type nuclear capsid. Uh, and again, since it's negative strand, it has to have the polymerase associated with it. Uh, and the polymerase is actually associated with the nuclear capsid. So you have a very similar thing. The nuclear capsid is coated in a nuclear capsid protein, which is called NP for nuclear capsid protein. Uh, again, it has an envelope. Uh, and uh, again, there's Underneath the envelope, there's a maturation protein, which is going to play the same role as it did in rhabdoviruses and paramyxoviruses, enabling the envelope components and the nuclear capsid components to get together during assembly. Uh, this protein is called M1, um, as, as opposed to just M, because there turns out to be another protein um, that I'm going to be talking about later called M2. Uh, but this is the, what, the major uh, maturation protein. And again, there are two proteins in the cell surface. Um, one of these is a hemagglutinin, and one is a neuraminidase. And the hemagglutinin here has the fusion activity. So again, there's a distribution of labor, but automyxoviruses are, putting these, uh, are using a dis different distribution of labor from the paramyxoviruses. And you will need to know definitely these two proteins because they are heavily based on, on the epidemiology. Uh, the epidemiology of influenza is heavily based on these. Okay, so I said they're pleomorphic. So just like the paramyxoviruses, although we frequently show them as being spherical, 
Um, they frequently can adapt different shapes because, again, they are packaged very loosely like the plastic bag rather than the shrink wrap. Uh, and in fact, this is some virus growing in tissue culture where you tend to get nice fresh virus because you harvest it uh, after a relatively short time and it looks pretty good because it's all being cleaned up and everything. Um, but if you um, isolate it from fresh samples, um, what you get is this mucky looking stuff. Uh, but you can actually, if you look here, you can see a sort of fringe around these. In fact, if you look very carefully on those rhabdovirus pictures, you can also see the fringe. And that is those glycoproteins sticking out like a sort of pile of a carpet on the outside of the membrane. And that's frequently why they were called spikes, because when you look at this, you can see little spikes sticking out of the virus. And those, those are these glycoproteins. And as I say, in this case, one is a hemagglutinin, and the other is a neuraminidase. And in fact... Um, just to refer back to the paramyxoviruses, I said if they don't have either activity, they're called G for glycoprotein. But the fusion protein is also a glycoprotein. All of these transmembrane proteins are glycoproteins. So, influenza. How does it get into the cell? Well, binds to an attachment protein, taken up in an endosome, acidified. Now that fusion protein becomes active, and it's part, in this case, of the hemagglutinin. Uh, and the two membranes fuse, the nuclear capsids go out into the cytoplasm, and here we hit on something that's of the viruses I'm going to talk about to you. This is the only RNA virus I'm going to talk to you about um, that goes to the nucleus. Uh, I just mentioned there is a, at least one other family that infects humans called Bornaviruses. We're not too sure whether that's a serious problem or not at the moment. It's controversial. Uh, but anyway, other, other RNA virus families do go to the nucleus, but very, very few. And so for what we're talking about here, influenza is the only one. Um, and these nuclear capsids have nuclear localization signals, and they go to the nucleus. So this is a virus that's going to the nucleus. So it's, going, it's now in the nucleus, and it's going to make its RNAs, and it's got another trick. Uh, that we haven't met before. <coughs> it's a negative strand. So the first thing it has to do is make positive strand RNAs. It has to take the polymerase in with it. We don't provide the polymerase for copying RNA into RNA. Uh, but it's got a neat way of getting its cap. So it needs a methylated cap or it needs something in its place. And this one gets a methylated cap, but it doesn't make it for itself. What it does is it takes a host cell message and it's got an endonuclease in the virus particle as well. And that endonuclease will clip off about the last 20 nucleotides of a whole pile of viral messages. It doesn't really care what the message is, but it clips after an A. So I'm just showing the A there. I don't expect you to remember an A, but it enables me to explain what's happening. So it clips off this little bit from the end, five prime end of a message. If you remove a 5 prime end from our messages, they've got no special other features to stabilize them. They'll immediately be degraded. Um, this part will be. But this will be stable. And it, it binds, it then, it's a complex. It binds to that complex with the viral endonuclease polymerase complex. And that A will base pair with the 3 prime end of the influenza virus RNA, which is still in a nuclear capsid, just like the paramyxos and the rhabdos. It doesn't need to uncoat. Uh, and this A will base pair with this U, and so basically it will use this as a primer and then extend this. The viral polymerase will use this as a primer and extend this and copy in the 5 prime, 3 prime direction and copy the influenza RNA, whatever this particular segment is coding for. And so what you now have got is a messenger RNA where the cap and methylation came from the host cell, so-called cannibalism or piracy. I prefer piracy because cannibal is eating yourself and this is eating the host cell. So, <coughs> so this is basically grabbing a host cell cap and using it for its own nefarious ends, uh, copies the RNA, but then it adds a poly A. So it's got a polyadenylation activity uh, so it adds the other end for itself. So this gets around having to take in capping and methylation enzymes, so it gets around that, but if you think about it, it has to make up for that by taking in an endonuclease. So it's maybe a bit simpler, but it's 
you can see why not all viruses take this route. You always have to, it, there's always something to pay by breaking the rules. And in this case, you have to take in the viral endonuclease as well as the viral polymerase in order to make your messages. So all the messages at the five prime end have got a sequence of about 20 nucleotides that can come from a huge number of host cell messages. Any questions? Okay, so that endonuclease is, of course, virally coded, and, of course, it has to go in with the virion so that when it gets in, it's ready to go. The RNA polymerase is virally coded, and, of course, that has to be taken in as well. The poly A polymerase is virally coded because even though it's in the nucleus, I pointed out, you can't get at the host cell poly A polymerase to polyadenylate your RNAs because the host cell poly A polymerase appears to only work on RNAs that have been made by the host cell RNA polymerase. And since this has to be made by a viral RNA polymerase, because it's an RNA template, the virus has to provide the poly A. So that's why the, host, the virus doesn't use host cell enzymes. So you begin to wonder, why did it bother to go to the nucleus in any case? Uh, and one thing that it does use in the nucleus is the splicing machinery. So it's got eight segments, but it actually can make um, at least 10 proteins. Uh, because it can splice these messages. So in the case of, for example, the M segment, it can read the whole, it, the, the initial transcript can go to the cytoplasm, and that will code for that M1 protein. Um, or it can be, have an intron removed and spliced, and this will code for a smaller protein, which is called M2. And we'll come back to what M2 does in the clinical lectures. But the major maturation protein is M1, and that's made from the unspliced message. But that means you can, the flu is taking advantage of splicing to make some additional messages. Replication is much like what we said before. Um, it is authentic copies. It requires the nuclear capsid protein. Once there's enough of that, that, that polymerase changes from a replicase to, uh, from a transcriptase making messages to a replicase, copying this exactly rather than um, making poly A shorter versions with poly A tails. Uh, and again, there's no clear early late stage here. You just go for it. This is coated, as I just said, with nuclear capsid protein as it's made. And then for assembly, the nuclear capsids support, are exported, the new nuclear capsids, which got coated with M protein because it's taken to the nucleus. Um, got coated with M protein, the polymerase assembles with them, they're exported from the nucleus. That seems a bit odd, but then you think about ribosomes, and those are RNA protein complexes, they get out of the nucleus. These apparently are small enough to get out of the nucleus. Meanwhile, the glycoproteins have been being made in the cytoplasm and inserted into the plasma membrane, just as we saw with paramyxoviruses and rhabdoviruses. The maturation proteins have been made in the cytoplasm, and they have lined up underneath the plasma membrane because uh, they're going to play that same role in maturation. And the virus now, the nuclear capsids line up under the plasma membrane and push through, and you get virus budding out. And the hemagglutinin and the um, neuraminidase I'm going to talk about a little bit more, but does anybody have any problems with this so far? So the virus buds out, uh, and I talked already about the business about needing to get the, the fusion protein activated. So here, when the hemagglutinin fusion protein, remember it's all part of the same protein in flu, when it's made, it's made as a single transmembrane polypeptide. When it gets out into the big wide world, it's cleaved, but, and again, the two parts are held together by disulfide bonds. But it doesn't flip out the way it did before. It, that this is not available for fusion until it meets an acid pH. And then there's a conformational change. Now it flips out, and now it can be used. Uh, and so when the virus leaves the cell, if we don't have the enzymes in our fluid, this clip never works, and this, therefore, won't be able to work. Uh, but when it, it still remains, that this doesn't cause fusion until it gets into the next cell. So 
I have a little model just to finish the lecture with. What you can think of is here is your hemagglutinin infusion protein, fluor influenza. Here's its little transmembrane tail sticking out at the bottom. <coughs> so if we take this, it's basically tightly folded. It can't open. Nothing's going to happen unless we release it in some way or other. So as it gets out of the cell, that hemagglutinin isn't going to work in terms of fusion at all. But in the host cell fluids, we are kind enough to clip the rubber band. So now we have released that chain around it, but it's still, it's now able to be activated because I can now open it, the band has been released, but I haven't yet opened it. So when it goes into the next cell, it will wait till it gets into the endosome and when it meets an acid pH, it will say, coo or something and flip open and now it can cause fusion in the endosome. So what flu does is relies on us to cleave it in our fluids. So we actually, in our respiratory fluids, have got proteases that actually do this for it. And then when it gets into the next cell and meets acid, this thing can open. So it's got two stages of activation. If we can inhibit those proteases, uh, flu doesn't go anywhere. The neuraminidase is playing the same role as we saw before. And I've done a summary here for you. Um, so I think that's just review. So thank you. And uh, we'll cover rheoviruses tomorrow, so if you can bring the RNA sheets along, please.